Towards the very end, when Poppy takes the protagonist on an elevator to go further down to the bottom of the factory, Cassie Messi, a trusty friend, stays behind to seemingly operate the elevator before they can send the elevator back up so Cassie can get on it as well to join them. as Poppy alongside the protagonist are lowered down halfway, Cassie starts screaming and making sounds as if struggling with another entity seemingly attacking her. So what really happened here and what led to it? Going back, as we know, the prototype was one of his kinds capable of so much. At first, he was obedient and followed orders, but soon after, he showed hostility and a constant rebellious nature, trying on multiple occasions to run away. Despite killing many staff members, injuring many, trying multiple times to escape and even conspiring against the organization, trying to turn many against them, the organization for some reason only contained him rather than killing him, which might seem a little surprising and nonsensical but maybe there's more to the story. Maybe the prototype is a very unique and valuable asset to the organization that they are not willing to lose. The prototype despised being a test subject and tried everything in his power to destroy the organization. He conspired with many other mascots or toys and dolls to form a group and fight against them. One of his most devoted disciples was Theodore Gramble, whom we learn about through confidential files. He was an orphan child like many others in the play care who didn't have any parents or family to look for them if they were to go missing. So it made it very easy for the organization to perform their cruel experiments. Theodore was specifically targeted and groomed in order for the prototype to have his great escape. It looked as if the prototype didn't care much for anyone else but himself, trying to find a way out, but what came as a big shock was that when Theodore opened the security doors for him using a grab pack, the door opened, giving the prototype the golden opportunity to escape, with all security measures and cameras even being disabled. Despite having the chance to escape, something he wanted to do so badly, the prototype, instead of running away, stays behind and rescues Theodore, who gets a nasty shock from the grab pack. In the process, he gives up his freedom to save Theodore. As a result of Theodore being badly injured, the organization decides to use his functional body parts and surgically remove them and place them inside a doll known as Catnap to be another one of their mascots. Theodore, who is now Catnap, a living doll, learns about the prototype's sacrifice, starting to become more and more devoted to him, starting to see him as a pure and heavenly god in the shape of a broken and suffering monster. Someone who, despite looking as such, is kind and has been sent to free all that that are suffering under an evil organization. Catnap's devotion starts to take a different turn when he is heavily drawn towards the prototype and starts showing hostility towards the staff members after each time that he has an encounter with the prototype, as if being heavily influenced by him. This slowly results in Catnap becoming a loyal follower of the prototype, being used as a vessel to perform actions of him. That includes influencing other mascots and dolls to rebel against the evil Playtime Co. and seek revenge for what they have done to them. Keep in mind that majority of the dolls and toys are the consciousness of children and even babies, with them being easily impressionable and easily manipulated. Many of them don't even have the adequate training to know how to properly behave, basically being enslaved and tortured. And many of them after the mass massacre stayed babies and grew older in their plastic and fluffy bodies with their consciousness only getting older. So essentially they were babies left in the wilderness to grow on their own, hence why they were more instinctual and animalistic. For some of these dolls it would be easy to manipulate, but some other it would take a lot of trying and manipulation to make them hostile and give them the will to fight against their oppressors. They were kids after all and they were innocent, not seeking violence 
but with the right amount of persuasion and convincing, they learn to act, which brings about the Hour of Joy. The Hour of Joy was the catastrophic end to the evil organization of the Playtime Co. The toys killed anyone that they could find, innocent or guilty, and through the tapes. In Chapter 3, we learned the majority of the people working there didn't know about the cruel experiments taking place, and many who did know wanted to put an end to it. Many adults genuinely cared about the children. They adopted them or fostered them and treated them like their own children. In one tape, the Hartmans, a couple who fostered the child, became severely shocked and upset when they learned that the kid that they fostered was tested on and experimented, which made them break down when they wanted to adopt him. On another occasion, Richie, a tough man on the surface, expressed his heartfelt thoughts on how cruel it is that children barely get any sun and should go out. His colleague also agreed with him and found him to be a kind, compassionate man deep down. I take it you're not a fan of this place, are you? Nope. Never liked the feel of it. I mean, don't you think these kids deserve some real sunlight instead of floodlights and painted skies? Hell, we're not even allowed to talk to these kids. Isn't that... <clears throat> <sighs> Sorry, Stu. Sorry? <laughs> that doesn't sound like the rich I know. Honest to a fault. But uh, I always liked that about you. They've been pushing hard for me to choose my replacement. I'm thinking about giving the role to you. Another woman called Claire, learning about her adopted child, feeling sick and traumatized after experiencing the red smoke and the possibility that the child called Marie would be experimented on. She broke down and screamed from the top of her lungs to stop it. <laughs> I felt like her blood was boiling beneath her skin. She saw something too. Something horrible. She... Uh, I'm sorry. I don't mean to. Miss Harper, we'll provide the very best care we can offer. You have my word. There are many concerns we must address at this time. And we'll continue to monitor. She'll be okay. No! Therefore, it's safe to say that majority of the people in Playtime Co. didn't know about the experiments or if they did know, they wanted to save them or stop the cruel experiments. So it's understandable why Puppy found it to be extremely unjustified for the toys to brutally kill and devour everyone there, including the innocent adults. It might be excusable that the children, not knowing any better and suffering from hunger, were manipulated to commit these actions. But what's not forgivable is that the prototype, seemingly an intelligent adult, acted as such and forced all the toys and dolls who are mainly children act savagely. The prototype not only wanted to kill anyone innocent or guilty, but he also killed directly or indirectly toys and dolls which were children who disobeyed him. He killed them brutally, in graphic manners and without any mercy. Cannot being a devout follower of the prototype committed atrocities beyond comprehension. He tortured and brutally murdered anyone who didn't follow the strict rules of the prototype. He simply called them heretics and punished them. We are talking about children who didn't want to commit atrocities and murder. Children who are probably shown kindness and compassion by many caring adults who truly cared for them. So seeing them murdered in such brutal fashion made them want to stop the killer dolls. There's clear evidence after the hour of joy, or maybe even during the massacre, many dolls and toys were butchered. We know for sure Catnap was involved, as he was used as a vessel for the prototype and killed many who disobeyed the prototype. It's not clear why they chose to stay in the factory after killing everyone, especially as the prototype always wanted to escape. But maybe, after killing their oppressors, the very grounds which tortured them and was their prison became their domain and their kingdom, where they could easily live in safely from the outside world, so it would make sense why the prototype would now choose to stay. Maybe even occasionally they would go out and hunt nearby people to bring them back and consume them. Log code 24459. In relation, experiment 1006. The prototype. 
stubborn as it is, and always silent with each passing session, I'm still uncovering fresh data nonetheless. Today's discovery... End of log. Ready to talk now, are you? I possess... A question. Go ahead. Do you feel anything? This question was fun to once, exactly. You stick us. Feed us. Tear our flesh. Do you feel it? There is a secret inside you, 1006. Valuable beyond all measure. I cut and run and burn at it. And I get closer with each session. So speak. Or don't. Fight. Or give in. Regardless, I learn something new about you every day. It excites me. Thank you. You thank me. Absolutely. I learned something new about you every day. Majority of the dolls didn't speak in the factory, apart from a few such as Mummy Longlegs, Dog Day, and Poppy. Catnap also uttered some words, including Miss Delight. Apart from them, all others seemed very animalistic, acting on instincts than cognitively. What these dolls have in common is that they all have higher cognitive abilities. Miss Delight was appointed as the teacher, and the others who could speak became whether leaders or main followers of the prototype higher in the hierarchy, or they became the opposers to the prototype and the senseless massacre. So it shows whoever had the ability to speak had higher cognitive ability. They were the ones who could easily convince or manipulate other toys and dolls to do certain things. Catnap, Mummy Longlegs, and the prototype seemed to be able to communicate and therefore manipulate others. The others lacked the ability to speak, whether they were children or babies, easily impressionable, or in the process of the experiment, lost their ability to speak and think clearly. On the other hand, dolls like Puppy and Dog Day, who stood firmly against the prototype, they had higher cognitive ability, being whether adults or not losing their rational thinking abilities. Like many dolls who lacked the ability to speak, showing lower cognitive abilities, Kissy also seemed a little naive, hence why she participated in the hour of joy killing, being easily manipulated but regretted her decision later on and with the right amount of guidance and compassion from Puppy. She joined her cause, going against the will of the prototype, essentially becoming a better version of herself. And we also see that she doesn't speak, so maybe she has lower cognitive ability. Despite having good intentions now, Kissy is still seen being on the edge and being naive and hostile as she tackles the protagonist when, with the guidance of Puppy, she stops, who tells her that the protagonist is one of the good ones. Therefore, this shows that she was not bad and is also not bad, but was badly manipulated like many other dolls and toys. Hence why Puppy wants to kill the prototype and possibly liberate the others who are whether forced to follow him or are manipulated by him. So despite it seeming as if Puppy is solely driven by the sense of revenge, she possibly wants to free others and save them from his severe punishment. It's no surprise the prototype killed anyone opposing him, so it wouldn't be too surprising that he would kill Puppy or Kissy Missy, as they are on a path to destroy him and free others, seen as heretics in his eyes. Hence Kissy Missy was the right target to die, fighting against them, and it would make sense for the prototype to attack her at the end and destroy her. So to answer the question towards the end, to who attacked Kissy Messi, it's most likely it was the prototype who was the culprit. Especially as Poppy mentions that Catnap was the final obstacle in their way to reach the prototype. 
It would even make more sense to corner her alone, as Kissy Messy is a giant being involved in the Bigger Buddies initiative, hence being the most powerful out of them all, so it would be easier for the prototype to target her alone, kill her, and then easily face the protagonist and Puppy, who would be easier targets on their own. Puppy, seeing Kissy Messy as her close friend or even daughter, anxiously goes up, risking her own life to get to her aid, helping her. Her anxiety is truly depicted when she hears her screams, showing how much she cares about her. As we know, Poppy seems to be an adult, not yet confirmed who she is, but I believe it's most likely Stella Graber, who might have been an adoptive parent herself, adopting none other than Kissy Missy. That's why she sees her as her daughter, which makes sense why they have such close relationship with each other. And that's it for this video, folks. What are your thoughts and opinions? Let me know down in the comment section below. As always, it's been your host, Star, and I will see you on the next one. Have a fantastic day.